Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important discussion about educational equity and the role of SEL in ensuring that every student has access to the resources he or she needs to be successful. Before we begin today, I'll review just a, quick, a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, we will be accepting questions throughout the webinar and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please send in your questions for the expert panel as they come up for you during the presentation. You can do that with the questions feature in your control panel and we will put them in the queue to be answered during the Q&A. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can use the questions feature to get our attention and we'll do our best to resolve that problem for you. Um, and also during the presentation, we will have a few opportunities um, for you to engage with us directly through polling. So please be on the lookout for the poll questions and we'll be interested in hearing from you about your opinions on a few questions. And at the end, we'll be sharing a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides with you. So keep an eye on your email inbox tomorrow for details on how to access those slides. Now, to get started, um, let me introduce myself. I'm Melissa Schlinger. I'm the Vice President of Practice and Programs for CASEL. Um, I oversee CASEL's initiative with our partner districts, and you're going to be hearing more about SEL and about those partners um, today. And I'm really excited to welcome our panelists. Um, we'll be hearing from the folks from Tulsa Public Schools, including Stephanie Andrews. She's the Director of Student Engagement at Tulsa Public Schools. She's been with the school district since 1999 and works in the Office of Student and Family Support Services, and she leads the district initiatives in SEL. Um, she's joined by her colleague, Jamie Lomax, who's the Director of Organizational Learning and Equity. Jamie has been with Tulsa since 2008 and currently leads the district initiatives in transformational change and equity. We'll also be hearing from Justina Schlund, the Executive Director of Chicago Public Schools, Office of Social and Emotional Learning. In her six years at CPS, she has focused on reducing the use of punitive dis disciplinary practices and launching a district-wide initiative to build organizational commitment to addressing issues of race and equity. We're thrilled to have all of our panelists today, and I'm excited to also just provide a little bit of background for you on um, SEL and on CASEL's work. Um, and we're going to start with a quick poll. First, it would be great to hear from those of you on this webinar, how many of you attended part one of our SEL and equity webinar series? So you'll see just a quick yes or no. We'll give everyone just a couple minutes. It looks like um, numbers are coming in. It looks like we're roughly at half and half. Um, so, okay. So we'll share with you those results. About 49% were here and about 51% were not. Um, at that last webinar, we really focused on SEL itself and how we think about equity in, with respect to SEL was much more of an academic presentation. Um, we got some good feedback on the information, but a real hunger for hearing about what actually happens in schools and districts around SEL and equity. So we're excited about part two of this series to really dig into that topic. Um, so as I mentioned, before we get into that, we're going to talk a little bit about what SEL is, just really briefly as a review, and then we're going to get into what we actually do with this. Um, so just as a reminder, um, CASEL defines SEL as the process through which both children and adults acquire and effectively apply knowledge, attitudes, and skills to understand and manage their emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy, establish and maintain relationships, and make good decisions. Um, you're all probably familiar with our wheel. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of this wheel since we did that on the last one, but you're certainly welcome to look at our website for more information. But um, just quickly, the areas in orange, these are the areas um, of self-awareness and self-management. In self-awareness, this is really how well do you understand yourself and also um, how well are you managing um, your interactions uh, with, with those types of um, awarenesses. So, on self-awareness, we're talking about how do you think about your own emotions? Do you, how do you understand your own cultural identity? How do you understand your own growth mindset, your self, 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 sense of self-confidence? 
And when we think about how we manage that, that this has to do with, are we able to manage the stress in our lives? Are we able to stay motivated, persevere? What kind of grit do we have? Are we setting goals and so forth? So this all has to do with the individual. These areas in green have to do with how we interact with others and how we understand others. So social awareness is where we talk about empathy and perspective taking and really appreciating diversity and respect for others. And relationship skills, of course, are more about how we engage with others, how we communicate, how we manage conflicts, uh, how we seek help and so forth. And then lastly, responsible decision making, putting that all together to really problem solve, analyze situations and, and so forth. So that's just a quick review of the competencies. The next question is how we promote those competencies. Um, and we do, in order to really think about SEL systemically, Castle supports a systemic view of SEL. Um, no, can you go back please? Um, where we're really looking at what happens in the classroom, schools and communities. So at the classroom level, we're talking about how are we explicitly teaching these skills and also what is the classroom climate that we're creating where people feel included and respected and a part of um, a caring community. And also how does that translate to what's happening in the school? What are the school's discipline policies, the overall school climate? How are we interacting with the adults in the building and how are they interacting with each other? And then of course, also what does this mean for how we're connecting in with homes, um, the families and our community partners? So really when we think about SEL at Castle, we're really talking about all of these competencies that we're promoting in all of these environments. This is what we mean by a systemic approach to SEL at the school level. Um, we know that by focusing on SEL, that there's a lot of research that helps us understand that this type of work leads to these outcomes. Again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the SEL research, but these outcomes are um, both short and long-term outcomes that we're looking for. We want to actually create the schools that lead to those outcomes. And then the question on the um, is also, how do we create schools with what we're doing at the district to create those outcomes. So what types of foundational support can we be doing at the district to create schools like this? Um, for example, what's our communication strategy? How are we thinking about the way we staff and budget for SEL at the district level? And then there's a big emphasis on what are we doing with our adults at the district office and at the school leadership level to make sure that SEL is part of their job. Not only are they experts in understanding it, but how, what is their own SEL competence? And then the third one is, what are we actually doing explicitly to promote SEL for students? Um, are we actually thinking about what standards are in place? Do we have an MTSS or um, a system for supports? Do we have um, programs in place? And then lastly, like what kind of data are we using for continuous improvement? So how are we actually looking at how we're measuring the impact of this work and how we're also measuring, are we actually implementing as we thought? So that's the... the um, that, that is really the model of CASEL's um, systemic approach to SEL. Um, the next slide actually talks a little bit about our district partners, where we're talking about the, the districts with whom we partner to do this work. I just went through the model. We have partnerships with these 20 districts to support their work on these areas in the model. Um, and we'll be hearing from today, Chicago Public Schools, which we've been working with since 2012, as well as Tulsa, which is a newer partner. Um, the ways in which we work with these districts have to do with not only technical assistance on how we're approaching SEL and how they're thinking about this from the district and school level, um, we are also trying to capture our learnings and create tools for the field, which you can find on our website. Um, and one really important thing that we're doing here is supporting um, their opportunity to convene with each other and collaborate with each other and really learn from each other. Um, so we will bring these districts together many times throughout the year in person or virtually to allow them to really think through um, strategies for implementation and especially around topics that are of high priority. Um, one of the sort of convenings that we have seen really as a priority for the districts and also has a lot of energy around it is our equity work group. Um, this is a group um, of folks from each of the 20 districts. We have the SEL lead and the equity lead from all 20 districts get together a few times a year in person as well as um, virtually to really think about how are they thinking about this work in their district 
um, and how can they be more thoughtful about how these things are integrated with each other. It also gives them a chance to learn from each other on best practices and it also helps CASEL think through these strategies and how they inform the work about our own um, definitions of the theories of action and whatnot. Um, so what you're going to be hearing today is from two of the districts and um, they'll be talking a little bit about their work and also how the equity work group and the convenings have helped them think through their work. We'll start by turning it over to Tulsa Public Schools, where you'll hear from Stephanie Andrews and Jamie Lomax. Good morning. This is Stephanie and Jamie. <laughs> and if I click, I hope this works. Perfect. Um, so a brief introduction to Tulsa Public Schools. I, I think sometimes there's visions of um, cowboy hats and only cowboy boots, but um, our district does serve around 40,000 students, around 73% um, are free and reduced lunch. And we, we do um, consider ourselves a district who is dealing with many of the things many urban districts are dealing with, um, and along with um, an emerging ELS population and newcomer population. One of the things that is particularly interesting to note about Tulsa um, and has serious implications for the way we think about both um, adult SEL and equity work is the fact that Tulsa was the site of perhaps the worst race massacre in our country. It was, Tulsa was the home of the most prosperous black community, Black Wall Street, and in 1921 this um, community was destroyed as a result of um, some events that led members of the larger community to attack Black Wall Street and decimate it, which has led ultimately to two Tulsa's. There is a, a separation and isolation um, and it infiltrates every part of, of the system and of the city. And I think when we think about what this means for us long term, it when we're thinking about equity and trying to launch conversations, it's important to understand that this event was not discussed until the 2000s. So there were two Tulsa's rooted in an event of violence and nobody talked about it. It wasn't taught, it wasn't part of the conversation and there are adults who um, would get to uh, meet somebody and learn about it and would be shocked because it's just something we never talked about. So that leads us to how do we get to the conversation about equity? Sure, and, and starting with where Jamie was, um, I can say that having been in Tulsa public schools since the, the 90s, that we were sort of doing, um, we, I know we used this random acts of, it was really random acts of equity to sort of address this. And so we had a history of lots of fragmented trainings around the disproportionality and our suspense, uh, suspensions, as well as lots of cultural competency trainings. Um, we were looking at data, we were talking, I, I moved up to district office in 2012 and we were having these conversations, but they were very siloed. And it wasn't until 2015 with a new superintendent and a new strategic plan where we were actually able to um, sort of do this work in a different way. And so with the launch of the new strategic plan, which came about in, was adopted in January of 2016, equity, as defined here on the screen, was identified as our leading core value, which provided a strong platform for us to really start thinking about what does it mean to lead for equity in our system. And you'll see this is our strategic plan and destination excellence this is our base camp. That's what that the picture is. And I think the exciting part is that if you if you, any of you get a chance to get online and read our strategic plan, um, I think we highlighted several hundred um, social emotional learning competencies in the plan. But I think the real root of it is in this theory of change of learners, contributors, designers, and any professional learning we do with adults and all of our strategic planning and our arcs of learning are designed around um, how do we address learners, 
how do we contribute together and then how do we design things so i think that's really powerful and this gets us to a real human-centered design which is very different than where we were before one of the foundation pieces of getting to this human-centered design was identifying what does it mean to lead for equity to that end we engaged in partnership with national equity project and spent a year with the district leadership um, exploring what it means to be a leader for equity, understanding issues of equity, developing our equity consciousness and our equity vocabulary with the school board, the super team, which is our superintendent's team, the chiefs, extended leadership team, which encompasses all of middle management of the district office and school leaders. Um, the beautiful thing about working with National Equity Project is that they're they have four core competencies that are centered in equity consciousness, but it is SEL leadership, design leadership, content leadership, and facilitative leadership. And so SEL is embedded in every piece of the learning and work that we do. So as we move forward together, trying to identify like, what is it that brings uh, what is it that Sorry about that, everyone. Um, we just had a little bit of audio interference there. Um, <laughs> I think you should be set now, Jamie. Sorry about that. It's okay, thanks. We really settled on this idea of belonging, which you can see over here in the leftmost uh, cog in the wheel, that we think that success in both equity and SEL is rooted in a deep sense of belonging. And so this kind of, these essential questions, we think interact with one another as evidenced by the design of the picture to lead us closer to equity and SEL. And is really grounded once again in human centered design. It's all about designing for the humans in the system and not um, as we sometimes do in school systems design as though we were a, a widget factory. We know that we're not. And so we're really always trying to keep this idea at the center that we are all around about developing humans. The ability to advance the screen. Yeah, we're a little bit stuck. Can you? There we go. Thank you. And so going back to our theory of change around learners, um, contributors and designers, um, I want to talk a little bit about how we're doing that with new teachers and you can talk about equity ambassadors. Um, with new teachers, we have about 500 to 600 new teachers a year. And so when we're planning um, like for their onboarding um, this year, especially we, we realized that one of the things is really to address the social emotional needs that are specific to our new teachers and we're spending at the very beginning of onboarding almost a day and a half of really unpacking what needs do they have what competencies do they have what sort of self-assessments um, can we use from castle for a new teacher to sort of unpack that and know where they are and be able to bring their most powerful selves to their classrooms with their students and equity ambassadors is another specific specific program that we've engaged in over the past about year and a half which was designed to be, it's a self-selected teacher cohort that meets monthly over the course of the year to focus on equity topics with the intention that um, the teachers who experience this then become ambassadors and are able to have difficult conversations and identify when inequities are occurring in schools and are able to kind of be leaders as in their school system. Um, and, they, and we talk about a variety of different things about implicit bias and stereotype threats about belonging. And then we get into some really tough stuff about like, what is white fragility and how does it affect the way we show up in classrooms and um, with kids? What is the systems of advantage and oppression that lead to inequitable outcomes? So we have these long term conversations and equity and SEL are embedded together because it is actually impossible to have these conversations. <laughs> unless you tend to the adults SEL needs in the room. So we spend a lot of time thinking about, thinking about what does it mean to 
see SEL skills through an equity lens, like self-awareness is in equity about understanding your beliefs, your biases, identity, um, and all of the SEL skills we've kind of expanded into what do we think that means from an equity lens. And in the learners, I want to just point out that we um, have some obvious um, professional learning that is grounded in like foundational skills, like the foundations of social emotional learning. And when we think of social emotional learning through an equity lens, we concentrate again about how um, social emotional learning can be a tool or it can also be a weapon. So it's really important for us and um, to talk about the idea that what do, when we talk about self-regulation of students, um, that we can use that actually as a weapon. So it's really important that you don't ever separate social emotional learning from equity and some of our bias work because we found that it, um, it's really important for us to call that out. When I think about um, our, uh, our next design as contributors, um, it went ahead. It did, it jumps. Really fast, there we go. And um, we also, this is our first year. Um, we were excited to sort of, we had done some foundations of social emotional learning and some foundations of culturally responsive teaching practices with our school leaders. And so uh, Jamie and I were able to spend two and a half hours every month with um, school leaders that self-selected to do a deep dive around the intersection around social emotional learning and culturally responsive teaching practices. And that's something we're happy to share our abstract and our ideas and our planning on that, but it was really powerful. Um, I think we probably learned more as the facilitators um, than even possibly the participants. Um, but since it's a contributor and we were doing it together, it was a, an opportunity that I think really helped um, solidify the idea that you can't do equity work separate from social emotional learning work. Another way we think of contributors is how are we engaging the broader community? And so that's why we designed community conversations, which are evening monthly sessions open to the public, and they are focused around various issues of equity that we think are critical for our students and our community to succeed. So we started in understanding Tulsa history um, with one of our sessions was exclusively devoted to the race massacre with a local expert, Hannibal Johnson, giving a history. He's done extensive research. And the idea was to create space for people to connect, learn, and discuss across difference. And so it's really grounded in the Courageous Conversations um, guidelines, right, the Courageous Conversations agreements. And so we're trying to bring those SEL skills about being able to stay engaged and listen across difference and be comfortable with not having a conclusion to a conversation um, to beyond our four walls of the district and more broadly into the community. The last thing we'll talk about as far as specific action strategies that we're taking is liberatory design. And so in partnership with National Equity Project, we are supporting some district teams and school teams to engage in this liberatory design process, which was designed by NEP in collaboration with the Stanford Design School. And it is, you'll notice a pretty typical user-centered design with two significant additions of this notice piece and reflection. And so noticing is about understanding your own positionality and your identity, your power, your privilege, and how that affects the way you think about designing. Uh, then it is also embedded with reflection points across this, the time, because if we don't reflect, we're at risk of unintentionally repeating oppressive practices. And so it's really asking us to think about how do we um, understand the dominant culture so that we are not reproducing dominant culture within our schools and we're disrupting the dominant culture that keeps many of our students from succeeding. So quick, a quick poll. We would be interested to know from you, from our audience, what system do you have set up in your districts? Do you have SEL departments, equity departments? Are they one and the same? Um, do neither exist? Because I think this is important to know 
how we're set up because it influences what happens. So if you'll take a second to vote, we'll wait. Right. And what do we have? We are not seeing results on our end just yet. It's just the question. Uh, we'll close the poll here in just a second. We've still got some folks answering, it looks like. Perfect. Thank we'll just you. give it a few more seconds. All right. I will close it now and share those results. All right, so we are a little bit all over the place. We have a representation <laughs> in every area. Um, it looks like the we have about 27 total percent that has an equity department, 30 with an SEL department. Okay, so the way we're set up is we have both. We have an SEL, I mean, both positions, we should say. So we have, um, this is how we sort of collaborate. And I think that this might help some of you in that if you'll see that um, I'm the director of student engagement and my stream of work is social emotional learning, but there's not necessarily a social emotional learning department. Um, the same thing that there's, you know, um, you'll see that I work in the student and family support services department under the chief of schools. Uh, Jamie works um, in, under the chief of teaching and talent in the talent management department and her streams of work are around organizational learning and equity. So uh, just one thing I wanted to point out before we close up is that we're excited that we have both of us get to have our work be in both of these areas. However, it is a challenge to um, be in separate, be report to separate people being very separate offices. And so one of the things that we have learned is that we have to be very intentional when we write professional development, we plan together when we're writing theories of action or arcs of learning very important for us to work together as well as um, um, sort of I we always I'll try to be Jamie's mini me when I'm in meetings and, and vice versa um, as we do work just trying to keep both of the sets of work in mind as we continue this journey together because we really do uh, don't see social emotional learning and equity as, as separate things that they have to be uh, together so thank you um, and I think it's now time to turn it over to Chicago <coughs> Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Christina Schlund from Chicago Public Schools, and I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Um, just to give you kind of a sense of who we are in Chicago. Um, we're the third largest school district in the nation and have about 380,000 students in 646 schools. Our students are primarily, as you'll see, black and brown, 80% um, free and reduced lunch. And I'm really proud to say, according to Stanford Research, we're also leading uh, the 100 largest school districts in the nation with academic gains. Um, so that's something we're really proud of. Um, and we've been working through with a three-year vision. Um, and we've defined equity within our three-year vision as a moral imperative and one that requires us to kind of not only provide the additional resources and supports to students who need it, but to truly begin breaking down barriers, um, the metaphorical fence in the, in the images that you're seeing that we've constructed in the first place. So um, to, to kind of give you some background about our SEL work, um, we've been a CASEL partner since 2011, and our Office of Social and Emotional Learning is really focused around these three priorities. Um, so we've been really working to develop these safe, supportive school environments focused on caring relationships, um, as well as promoting our students' social and emotional skills, development, and growth. Um, and, and then we also have kind of a whole stream of work that's really around how do we foster the staff mindsets and capacity to respond to student behaviors compassionately, restoratively, and equitably. 
equitably. Um, and and I, I think, um, you know, to go back to the poll question that uh, it's also just posed to you all, we have no equity office currently in Chicago Public Schools. Um, so our Office of Social and Emotional Learning has really owned uh, recently a lot of that equity work. Um, so I, I want to share kind of with you the, the issues that we've really been focused on um, around equity. And, and first and foremost, I think, like most other districts in the nation, um, the biggest challenge that we face from equity is that students who face social economics and other factors that are beyond their control continue to be really strong predictors of their access to educational opportunities and their school performance. Um, and then secondly, specifically, SEL, um, similar to what, uh, uh, you know, Jamie um, had talked about around kind of this concept of SEL being both a weapon um, and a tool for equity, um, we've seen that sometimes SEL implementation can focus on uh, this lens of a white middle class shield development um, or be viewed as that behavior management strategy for some kids and that's usually code for black and brown kids. Um, so I want to share kind of a couple of the strategies that we've been working on in partnership with Castle's Equity Workgroup, um, which has been really an incredible source of support and ideas for us. Um, and I, I want to preface by sharing these and by saying that um, with these strategies, we still have a long way Justina, to go. I'm so sorry but, to interrupt you. Um, Justina, again, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but we're having a lot of people who are having difficulty hearing you. Um, it's just really garbled and choppy. I'm wondering, are you also... Um, are you on your phone as well as on the computer audio? I'm not, but I'll call in on my phone to see if that helps. Apologies. Okay, for I'm so sorry. And folks in the audience, we apologize for the interruption, but I know you all want to hear Justina. So um, I think let's just take a minute here to get her better connected. While we're on the break, um, we also saw a lot of questions coming in from those of you that were not on the first presentation expressing interest in that. So we will send to participants of this presentation both part one, the recording, as well as the recording to this one. So thanks for raising that because I understand that half of you um, didn't see the, um, the first presentation. Also, some folks asked for links to some of the specifics that Tulsa had um, asked about, uh, that had described. We will um, provide you with some links to resources that were mentioned in this. Also, I would encourage you to go to CASEL's website, and you can see on CASEL's District Resource Center a lot of information about SEL in general and the, the work that districts are doing around systemic SEL. We've tried to capture those there in a library for you around the areas of implementation. We don't currently have a, a deep library on equity, although we're building that. Um, so we expect to be able to launch that hopefully later this year that really does capture the great work of the equity work group and these districts, but you will see some um, evidence of that as well. Um, while we're waiting for Justina, maybe we could take another, take a question that's already come in for Tulsa. Um, uh, so the team from Tulsa, there was a question about what are some of the most important topics that you cover for new teachers that are onboarded in your district as part of your work? Um, maybe you could share a little bit about the onboarding process and what you see as the most important things around this area that you share. Yeah, that's actually, it's a really exciting time to be part of that conversation here in Tulsa because we're rethinking the framework of what it means to prepare new teachers to enter classrooms. Um, and so we've developed kind of a framework grounded in the instructional core that provides focus on a variety of areas connected to rigor relevance and um, relationships. And I'm looking at it. So one of the pieces is about critical consciousness. Like how do we understand who we are and how who we are affects the way we show up in classrooms, particularly if we are um, have different life experiences 
than our students. So that's one piece. We're also thinking about culturally responsive practices. What does it mean to support students in ways that feel really accessible and rigorous at the same time? And then, um, so over on, we are looking at, so we always say that you have to build relationships with students, but what does that really mean? And so we are doing a lot of professional learning about um, relationships um, and that we, I feel like we've done a, not a great job of explaining that to teachers. So that's another part of the piece that we're working on. Um, and I think Jamie alluded to earlier, this notion of belonging. And so what I want to say that as a district last year, we did something that we called a quest and where we did what's called empathy interviews with hundreds of teachers and students and school leaders. And so this notion of belonging didn't just come up from us just dreaming it. Um, after doing all those empathy interviews, we came back with information that provided us that the, the need that was missing was this sense of belonging to either their school or to the district. Um, community. So that's where that came from as a focus. And so that's um, one of our focuses is how do we foster this sense of community and belonging for, for all teachers, but specifically for our new teachers and their new teacher experience. And, and we think that that looks different, that feeling like belonging is even a different level than just building a relationship with someone. Great, thank you. And I understand that we have Justina back on the line. So we apologize for the technical difficulties and we'll turn it back over to Justina. Hi everyone, so sorry. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay now. Just give me a signal if you can. Um, so so I, I was kind of sharing and, and apologies um, if you missed out on some of the previous slides, um, but I just gave some a brief background about who we are as Chicago Public Schools and how we've come to this SEL and equity work. Um, and so one of the key strategies that we've really started focusing on is really how do we develop our organization's commitment to equity first and foremost. Um, and, you know, we have a social and emotional learning department and um, have not had an equity department in Chicago Public Schools. Um, and so we've been kind of doing this siloed work, as Tulsa has mentioned, around equity in, in lots of different departments. Um, and really wanted to bring people together to say, um, we really need to be thinking about what a cohesive district action plan that aligns kind of our highest leverage efforts around race and equity um, so that we're working collaboratively around uh, improving student outcomes from an equity plan. Um, and I think uh, simultaneously, we um, have been thinking about how do we integrate this equity lens so that when we're considering all of our policies, all of our practices, um, and decisions that we're making as a district, that we're really, um, we're really uh, looking at the impact that that has on our subgroup students and on equity overall for our district. Um, and so we've been following the Annie C. Casey Foundation, um, Seven Key Steps for Advancing Equity. And what we've, what we've really done is begun by bringing together a really wide range of stakeholders um, from different district departments, but also our community partners, our parents, our students, um, to begin having these conversations about equity and where they perceive inequities in the district. Um, and we've been working with uh, university partners to kind of do some of this research for us um, but also doing it through monthly meetings with our entire kind of, uh, district leadership team and looking at the root causes of inequities and thinking about um, kind of systemic steps that we've taken that have driven us where we are today. Um, and we're currently in the process of identifying the key priorities, um, kind of those highest leverage strategies that I have mentioned um, around, around equity. So um, I'm going to I'm going to shift a little bit to talking more specifically about SEL. I kind of wanted to frame where we are as a district is thinking about equity very holistically. Um, but then I wanted to shift by thinking about what does this mean at the intersection of SEL and equity. Um, so I think we're going to pull a poll up here um, and to get us started and, and thinking about this. I really wanted to think about how would you describe the relationships between staff and students in the school or the district that you're working with. Um, so so um, 
as we for that think about are, are all adults in the building kind of caring for and showing respect to students? Um, is it that, you know, most relationships are supportive and respectful, but there might be a subgroup or two of students who aren't feeling that same level of relationship? Um, or or is it that a lot of or some or a lot of stakeholders in your building are feeling low levels of trust and respect? Or do you not have the data around it to be able to answer with confidence? Um, and there, there you go. So the, the poll should be up on your screen. So if you'll take a moment to just answer um, whether you see the relationship as strong, moderate, weak, or unsure. Mm -hmm. And Justina, while we're doing the poll, um, are you on a speakerphone? We're still getting a little feedback. It is better, but um, it's still a little hard to understand you. Thanks for that feedback. I was on some headphones, and I'm going to take them off now. Is that okay, any better? Yeah, you sound oh. better. You do. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm so I, – I really apologize, everyone, for the connectivity issues uh, that I've been having. So, so, so sorry about that. I think, I think we got to a good resolution, um, and it looks like we've got folks who have answered, so I'm going to close the poll and then share the results. Great. Um, so it looks like about half of you all uh, had answered that there's really kind of moderate levels of relationships going on in the building, and then some folks who said strong and weak or unsure. Um, and, and I think like the moderate, really the, the large number of folks thinking about those moderate relationships, um, perhaps what you're thinking about is are there pockets of students in your school building who are really experiencing school life different than other students um, in your building? Um, and so these are some of the questions that have been weighing heavily on our minds as well. And if we can go back to the slides here, great. Um, I want to kind of share a little bit about what we've been doing in this area. Um, so we've been thinking, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm going to click over the slides here. There we go. Um, we've been thinking really about three, one, two, five. Um, how do we create SEL practices that are really centered in relationships? Um, and, and, you know, I, I think a lot of this notion is how we're shifting from the idea that students are this individual unit of change when we're thinking about SEL into how are we really creating the supportive school learning environment and those relationships that we know really promote social and emotional growth for both students and adults. Um, and so a few years ago, our district created and released a set of school climate standards that are based on uh, kind of national school climate standards as well as the CASEL framework. And we've really uh, begun, um, you know, kind of pulling all schools accountable for creating really intentional practices around school climate development through collaborative leadership structures, um, restorative practices, and other, and other really intentional practices to build relationships between and among students and staff, as well as how do we create a sense of safety for all students, um, whether it's through shared agreements or restorative approaches to discipline. Um, and, and then lastly, how do we use curriculum instruction that embeds social and emotional learning, promotes student voice, um, and kind of brings all students into this engagement within uh, within the school building. Um, so, so listen, there are some of the practices that we've been doing in this area that also includes, I know there are several questions that have been raised around trauma-informed practices. Um, and so I think a lot how we do, how we do, um, how we support students who have experienced trauma. And a lot of that is really based on the same concept of relationships. Um, and, and then, as, which brings me kind of to this last strategy that I wanted to share, and we're really pushing towards this redefinition of SEL as a tool for social justice. Um, and one of the first steps to doing this, we believe, is to really confront the inequities in our own district, particularly around the disproportionate use of discipline for our black and brown students and our most vulnerable students. Um, a couple of years ago, the University of Chicago released a study that really showed um, that, you know, something we already knew, which is one, that our most vulnerable students are suspended at the highest rate, 
Um, in fact, they found that one in three students with documented cases of abuse and neglect were suspended in our district in 2015. Um, so really, again, that intersection of trauma and discipline and SEL. Um, and, and not surprisingly, we already know our African-American students, our students with IEPs, our students who are in poverty, continue to be suspended at multiple times the rate of their peers. What's really interesting about this research, though, is that it's found time and time again that while this is true, while there are certain populations of students who receive suspensions more than other populations of students, that their risk of suspension is actually more closely tied to the school that they attend than their background. And so what I mean by that is that schools actually have a really large impact on students' behavior, discipline, um, et cetera. And schools with, you know, very supportive learning climates, strong relationships, tend to have much lower suspension rates um, when compared to schools that serve very similar student populations but have worse relationships, have worse learning climates. Um, so I think, I think the message here is that we know that this proportionality exists, and we also know that we, we as adults in school districts and schools are the ones who are contributing to this disproportionality, right? Um, and so what we've done in Chicago Public Schools um, now is we've taken a really focused effort around addressing this disproportionality um, through a couple different streams. Um, one is through really intentional policy change that removes suspensions for minor misbehaviors um, and for younger students when focused on restorative approaches. Um, and then we've also kind of increased the accountability and transparency of our discipline data so that schools really have real-time access to disaggregated data, um, and we're publishing annually uh, public reports on school disciplinary practices. Um, and then lastly, we've been really increasing our level of professional development and coaching support, as well as resources and tools um, that are focused on developing those supportive school climates that I was just talking about and restorative approaches to discipline. Um, and then the, the final thing um, that I just wanted to talk about around our redefinition of SEL as a tool for social justice um, is we've been really thinking of about, and I should say beginning to think, this is still in very early stages, but we've been really beginning to think about how SEL can be used to promote student voice and civic engagement and explore racial and cultural identity. Um, so we've begun by bringing together our, our teaching and learning to partners in the academic department um, and developing some practices that kind of go beyond cultural responsiveness to think about how we're embracing multiple social identities and cultures and perspectives in our curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Um, and then, you know, our school climate standards, as I mentioned earlier, has really a key, uh, a key section that's really dedicated around student voice and, and civic engagement as core components of what a supportive school looks like. Um, and then we've also been using a teaching and learning framework that prioritizes very similarly student agency, authority, and identity. And then lastly, with everything that's going on in the world, um, we've been, you know, kind of doing this very small thing, but it has been developing and releasing real-time resources and tools for our teachers to discuss things like cultural events as well as race and bias with their students. Um, and so, so that's pretty much... Um, Kind of a high level overview of where we've been as Chicago Public Schools, and I think we still have a really long way to go, um, and, but have really valued the partnerships that we've had through Castle in, in being able to do this. Um, so, so again, I, I'll, I'll turn it back over uh, to Melissa for questions, um, but thanks everyone for your time, and again, apologies for the technical difficulties. Thanks, Justina. Um, and I also, um, we've been getting some questions in and we have some questions that were submitted as part of the registration process. Um, this question is for both of both districts to respond to. Um, what types of resistance have you seen in your districts in your approaches to these work and, and how have you overcome any major obstacles to the work? Um, so why don't we start with the Tulsa group? Um, in the, is the Tulsa group muted? Okay. Um, sorry, Jamie, go ahead. Um, this is Stephanie, and I can say that um, 
I, um, last year was really our first sort of official rollout around social emotional learning practices. And I can say that our response was really, really positive, like more positive than we expected um, around um, social emotional learning practices, which led us to believe there was some safety in um, the way that it was defined. And so we really pressed that. Uh, again, and, and making sure that we started to embed our equity language and work in there. And that's when I would say that we got a little, um, not as much favorable response. Um, go ahead, Jamie, you can speak to that. Yeah, but we started to um, move into the more explicit equity work. Like, obviously, it's uncomfortable, right? It's conversations that we systemically don't have as a country don't have. Like, what I consistently say is we're building our muscle to have conversations about race. It is not a conversation that we as a country lean into naturally, it's one that we actually avoid uh, pretty um, intensively. And so when we started adding the race layer into um, supporting all students, it was really hard for a lot of people. And it is still difficult, even the team who came together on purpose, right? Those people who self-selected into one of the programs like the School Leader Institute, Deep Dive or into Equity Ambassadors, when we start getting into that conversation, it's really hard, which is why we have to start with the SEL component and fostering our self-awareness, fostering our relationships so that when we are moving into the conversation, there is a safe place. I think that you can only be um, challenged in either relationship or in content and learning. I firmly believe that. And so what we have found is that there isn't a need for deep, authentic relationship in order to engage in those challenging conversations. Thank you. Um, and Justina, did you have anything to add about obstacles that you've seen in um, CPS or any any resistance? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we've experienced um, very similar things. Um, one obstacle I'll just talk about is, as we've been, the last piece I talked about is kind of this discussion of um, race and, and bias in current events. And um, we did have some pushback from um, community members, parents who, um, you know, basically said students shouldn't be talking about this issue. I think that was a particular response to a toolkit we released around Charlottesville, the Char Charlottesville incident. Um, and people were saying, you know, this isn't the time or place for students to engage in these discussions. Um, and it, it was really interesting. Um, we had, there, there were some comments on our Facebook page, and we had a, a couple of students who really spoke up in defense of this and saying that this is their real lives, right? Like, this is, this is the society they're living in, the world they're preparing to enter into, um, and they want to discuss this. Um, so we've actually really tried to address some of equity and SEL pushback by really elevating student voice around it and saying, like, let the students speak about, like, what the type of school they want to see is and what they want to be talking about. Um, and I think that's been really effective um, rather than just having it come from, you know, administration. Great. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, there's a lot of questions about additional information and links to things that you all referenced, um, research, tools, and so forth. So we will, um, as when we talk about this, we'll send those out as part of our follow-up. Um, but I do have a specific question for Tulsa and a specific question for CPS that I want to share before we wrap up. Tulsa, there's a lot of interest in more information about your community conversations. Um, so maybe you could speak a little bit more about the frequency of those and any additional um, information that would be helpful. Is this work done with um, Everyday Democracy or some other group? Who's participating? Those kinds of things. People are really interested in the community conversations. Yeah, this is Jamie. I'd be glad to talk about that. We started community conversations um, in 1617 and it's done locally right we leveraged local talent it's facilitated by the author that i um, referenced earlier hannibal johnson he's facilitated the last two seasons um, just some real tactical things about making them successful before i talk about kind of the more conceptual pieces don't have them in spring months or the summer or the fall if it's nice outside and it's light outside, nobody wants to come. So we have um, set those up in like October, November, December. Um, they are two and a half, what? Yeah, two and a half hour sessions. We offer dinner actually. We open our 
district office building and provide a, a dinner before each of the sessions because we truly believe that like community is built. We are really grounded in food, right? Like food is really important in main, creating and maintaining community. And so we think it's important to break bread with people, particularly when you're trying to create connection across difference. So like from 5.30 to 6, we offer dinner. At um, 6 o'clock, we launch into uh, the introduction to conversation. And those have been around a whole vast variety of issues like trauma, um, the experience of Native American students in our schools, um, supporting LGBTQ student populations and teacher populations. So we have run the gamut of issues relating to equity. We, like many other places across the country, are facing the question of whether or not to rename schools. And so one of our community conversations was like, what does it mean to, to name something? It was not a debate about yes or no, we should or should not rename a school. It was more focused on what does it mean to commemorate? How do we honor history? And what is the implication of a name, not a specific name? So these conversations have been really effective. We have often a panel who presents um, some their basic introductory information. And we take um, questions from the audience that get filtered through. And at a couple of points throughout the conversation, we pause and host table conversations so that the folks in the room get to make sense of what they're hearing, reflect on what is new, different, um, or exciting or challenging, and then think towards the end of the conversation about what does this mean for me and how am I going to move differently in the world as a result of what I now know. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, it's fascinating work. Um, Justina, for you, um, could you talk a little bit about your um, how you are me measuring climate in Chicago Public Schools, um, what's the tool? What are some of the things that are on that tool? Um, and also a note about um, how you're partnering with local universities for your work. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I, I'd say there's two main ways that we're measuring climate. One is on the school climate standards, we've developed a uh, school climate self-assessment where we ask school teams to kind of sit down and look through um, some specific indicators that ask them uh, around, you know, do we have um, clear expectations for all students across this school? And what do relationships look like between, similar to the question that I asked in the poll, we asked that relationship question in a more detailed way about um, leadership and staff, about between staff, staff and staff, about staff and students, and then between students. Um, and then we also ask questions about kind of what their discipline policies look like. Is there is there a process for examining root cause um, around student behaviors? Um, is there a trauma lens that they're taking to student behaviors? Um, as well as questions specifically around kind of curriculum and instruction. Is there time set aside in the day for social and emotional learning? Um, is social Are the social and emotional learning standards that we have in Illinois embedded into core content curriculum? Um, is student voice amplified? Um, things like that. So that's kind of one way. Um, the other way is all of our schools uh, take a, a survey called the My Voice My School survey um, that's run at the University of Chicago. Uh, about these five essentials of um, school improvement, and one of which is all around kind of supportive school environments, um, but also includes some very similar questions about how do students perceive the relationships in the building, how do teachers perceive it, um, and so that gives us some really robust data around that as well. Um, and then I think uh, the second part of the question was how we work with university partners. Um, we've, I mean, we're really lucky in Chicago to just have a lot of community partners in the area, but we've really um, worked closely with uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Chicago, um, as well as a number of other uh, organizations around here um, to, you know, just kind of like meet with the researchers ahead of time. I think a lot of people are interested in some of these questions around equity and social and emotional learning and, and trauma and all, all kinds of things. Um, and we've really worked with them by meeting with researchers um, kind of informally ahead of time to tell them what we're interested in um, and, and seeing how that aligns 
aligned to some of the work they've also been doing. Um, and we've also participated on various steering committees. Um, specific to the equity work, we had our research partner go out and do focus groups with uh, parents and teachers so that they wouldn't be, um, you know, sitting in front of a school administrator or a district administrator. Great. Thank you so much. And if you Google Chicago Public Schools climate standards, all of that will come up as a first link. So you can actually see it for yourself. Um, with that, we're out of time. So thank you so much, Stephanie, Jamie, and Justina for sharing all this great information with us. You're doing great work in this area and there's some really useful practices that you've shared um, to promote equity and social emotional learning. Uh, be, uh, I also wanted to um, remind you as you log off that you'll have an immediate poll so that we can get feedback on this particular webinar, which will inform the next one that we do. We take your feedback very seriously, so please take just a few seconds to answer a few short questions about that. Um, and I think that does it for us. Thanks again, everyone, and we will see you next time. Have a great day.